Hello, I'm Derek. Uh, I'm back. This time I have pants on. Uh, a little bit about me. Why should you care what I think? You probably shouldn't care what I think, but if, in case you do, uh, I'm a senior video, video principal, principal video engineer at Vimeo. I've worked on all sorts of open source multimedia stuff, sit on the video line board, just been involved with video since like 2004, and I post a bunch of crap on Twitter. So going to this talk, I think it's uh, good to know what angle I'm coming at this from. I work for Vimeo, which is a large, but not fang-sized, I'm glad Phil removed the wrong typo in that. Um, that's supposed to have two A's. Um, so we're, we're not fang-sized, we have scale, but we don't have fang-level cache. Uh, we're primarily UGC, which means long tail, large corpus, crappy user input, we do VOD live OTT, et cetera. And of course, I only speak English, um, I'm cognizant of the fact that like there's HEVC you know, deployments in China and stuff. Um, I don't really have much insight into that. I would love to. If you have insight to that, come find me. I would love to know. Um, and my understanding is the patent situation there can be interesting um, with like, things like AVS3. Um, so this is actually two talks. Uh, the first part's going to be about the economics of post the post H.264 world. The second part's going to be about uh, the state of codec development, that is the people developing the codecs. So first a confession, 10 years ago I was an HEVC true believer. The H.264 good times were in full swing. Why wouldn't the next MPEG product be just as great as a success? They definitely wouldn't screw it up with patents. Um, VP8, it existed, um, didn't have a spec, didn't need that. Yeah. Um, the only danger was Chrome said they'd drop H.264 and presumably other MPEG codecs. Um, I've heard that's in code review, it'll be here any day now. Um, but boy, was I wrong. So it's 2022, I'm gonna talk about a little why people have actually deployed HEVC. Um, I'll get to the other codecs later, but HEVC being the, the main thing people have deployed of the next gen, last gen, current gen, wherever, I don't know, depends where you sit on that topic. Um, so specifically, I want to talk about why non-mega corporations have deployed it. And the main reasons are shock and awe, not actually lower bandwidth and storage costs. It's features, uh, mainly for Apple and Dolby devices, mainly HDR. Some cheaper devices don't support AVC greater than 1080p because uh, they wanted to you know, keep the cheapest chipsets in there. Um, so you require HVC or VP9 for higher resolutions. So yeah, the upshot is people have deployed Newer codecs for features. Um, uh, so because of that, in addition to deploying a newer, slower codec, they also get the, oh, now we have to encode 10-bit. It's a higher resolution. So you know the, the slower encoding costs are even more painful. Um, well, I can't share exact numbers. I can tell you we're not saving money with HEVC. It's treated as a feature. And it's still, by and large, Apple devices consuming it. Um, and these, you might say it's fine, you can chunk your encode, it'll be faster, but that can still cost more because uh, those, even if you chunk into one minute chunks, throw on a bunch of stuff, uh, if you're relying on you know, cheaper spot instances, those spot instances, it could still be too slow for them, even with one minute chunks. You could you know, flow, overflow to on-demand instances and you lose a bunch of money. Um, and anecdotally, even ingesting uh, HEVC has been slower. Uh, I can tell you uh, Vimeo and plenty of other companies noticed when uh, the iPhone 12 Plus Pro Max, whatever it is, uh, deployed uh, HEVC HDR by default. You could see the costs ticking up as we had to ingest more and more of this um, because the HEVC decoder in FFmpeg is probably the least optimized decoder because open source people don't want to work on HEVC. Uh, VP8 and 9, again, VP8, not relevant. Uh, VP9 may not have the patent issues that HEVC had, but uh, the reasons for not deploying it wasn't that people didn't want to save bandwidth, it's that it came with a requirement, at least in the beginning, to use a new container, a new type of dash, and people didn't want to retool their MP4 infrastructure for that. Um, and WebM dash is pretty gross, it was a hack using the Trosky queues. Uh, and LibVPX back then was pretty terrible for rate control, it's just kind of merely bad now. Um, and I'm pretty convinced that hot take, Google didn't really care about people adopting it on the creation side, only on the decoding side, so you could, YouTube could save a bunch of money. And even, to, even for Google, they had to make their own hardware for it to be truly economical. Uh, they have a really good paper about it, actually. It's called like warehouse, uh, warehouse Size Distributed Encoding, something like that. It's really good. You should look it up. 
Um, I think Netflix eventually deployed it, but they waited for uh, MP4 support. They might have actually written the spec for that. Um, so who do and don't better codecs work for? Um, with, for HBC, there is patent liability if you're in a small and medium business. Um, which pool do you license with? Hope you get the right one. Um, it works really well for companies with small corpses, high consumption, your Netflixes of the world. Um, for UGC, I've not seen it be effective outside of like mega corp scale. Um, the long tail is kind of only really economical, like with, we made our own damn hardware for it. Um, hit me up if you know anything about that. Uh, live, a little bit more murky. Uh, Twitch was doing uh, trials with it. I don't know whatever actually happened to that. Most YouTube streams I see are still H.264. You can use a hardware encoder. You can use you know, SVT if you want HV, SVT, HVC. Throw a million cores at it, but at some point it's not cost effective to do that. Uh, now the, the, I guess what you would call current gen, uh, YouTube, AV1, of course. Uh, but the, the kind of the, hot, I'm just full of hot takes today. Uh, the real bandwidth returns, like the, the like cost savings, just they're diminishing versus compute unless you are serving a truly ludicrous amount of things. Like, it's the similar situation to what, like, where telcos are at, where like, Opus is good enough for most people, unless you're a telco and you want to cram in a zillion more phone calls on this you know, one kilobit or something. Um, I would be remiss without uh, mentioning the real use case Cisco has, where they replaced H.264 with AV1 and wrote their own encoder to do this, hyper-focused on their use case. Uh, this could be a way forward going, I'm not really aware of anyone else kind of targeting this hyper-focused encoder situation. Um, VVC, don't, I've yet to meet anyone who cares about VVC who didn't also work on VVC. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> so, upshot, H264, JPEG a video. I think everyone can understand what that means um, for all the pros and cons of that. Well, I skipped the other slide, whatever. Uh, so this is part two. Uh, developing codecs. When I started in video, codecs of the day were MPEG-2, MPEG-4, ASP, H.264, etc. One person could read and understand those specs and implement something that could be applied to current problems. This is no longer the case. Um, I won't say it was well documented. It wasn't. It's still not well documented. Um, but you could apply your newly gained knowledge to a current problem. Nowadays, literature just kind of stops at JPEG and H.264. You want to apply, you know, to cutting edge stuff. Uh, so yeah, situation we're in. It's turtles all the way down. Things are built on top of things, are built on other top of things. Nobody understands the things all the way at the bottom, except for the old gods. We saw one of those guys earlier. Um, uh, for context, at 32, I'm considered the young boy in the codec room. Um, that's kind of messed up. Um, in theory, you could go through the MPEG archives, find how all these proposals, they're actually open, you can go read them. Um, I don't know if it's deliberate or their system is just really bad, but it's, they're completely undiscoverable. You can't search for them, you can't find them. My own accepted MPEG proposal, I could not find. I had to look in my Slack history. Um, AOM? Uh, anyway, uh, not only that, like, you know, Yuri kind of supplanted this whole thing in his talk, literally talked about what I had listed here. Uh, things like how we got from the KLT to the DCT, you know, the, the work that was done on uh, the Luma, CIE illuminance, why, why IQ is rotated exactly 33 degrees, stuff like that. Um, not kind of well documented unless you like reading old scanned copies of RCA FCC proceedings. Um, and this sort of deep understanding is important. I, I would argue we, if we don't understand why something is done, done the way it is, how can we effectively apply it? How can we iterate upon it? Um, that's only going to get worse with AI. We'll get a spec with you know, 10 billion coefficients in it, and they'll go, we trained it on some videos. You don't have access to those videos. Um, and the coding tools are just kind of so numerous, you can't really be feasibly implemented and fully understood by one person in a reasonable amount of time. And I follow a lot of the working groups. Kind of feel like there's not a ton of novel new tools. It's kind of like more angles, different types of trees, better blocks. Uh, non-binary arithmetic coding. Uh, and this doesn't even touch on things like the dark arts of writing an encoder, like dead zones, trellis, all that kind of stuff. That's a whole separate talk. Um, anyway, the result. Massive, massive barrier to entry. Um, 
kind of, eh, it's a hot take, sure. Uh, a lot of uh, just mediocre multimedia engineers, not through fault of their own, but because this stuff is not well documented. Uh, and as a result, we end up repeating like a lot of stuff from the 90s, 80s, 70s. Some of it's good, some of it's not good. Uh, AV1's MSAC used to just be called normal arithmetic coding. Wavelets, again, wavelets. Uh, and so you get a lot of smart people. You might have, but very few people who have the breadth to understand the, the, the whole wide scope of how something interacts with other things, like someone who's specialized in transforms but doesn't necessarily have the, the breadth to understand how they interact with the entropy coder or the uh, you know, various predictions or stuff. And you'll see mostly running a million different encoder and tests to understand that rather than have like a holistic understanding. And like, of course, none of this was taught in university. The most thing I got taught in university is like, ooh, here's a Fourier transform, wow, cool. So how do we fix this? Uh, I don't have a solution. If I said I had a solution, I would be full of crap. Uh, I argue we may have to pe make peace with less profits to invest in a better user experience. We've all got really, really spoiled by X264 over the last 15 years. Um, AI and encoders, jury's out for me at least. Um, what would be interesting, I think, is specialized SIMD instructions in you know, x86 or ARM processors. And I don't mean A6 like QuickSync, but like actually SIMD instructions specific for codecs. There are some kind of. Um, anyway, you should tell me. I want to be wrong. Don't try to sell me something. Uh, as for the understanding, I would pay a very, very, very large amount of money to have Yuri, Gary Sullivan, et cetera, whoever, just write a tome of all you know, video background. I'd like truly ludicrous amounts of money I would pay for this. Um, better university education, I'm not sure. Um, but arguably, is it, does it matter? H.264, JPEG of Codex, are we done? Will we be relegated to be the, co the COBOL consultants in 70 years? I don't have a problem with that, I'll get paid a lot of money. But I'd like to note we haven't solved the COBOL problem in banks either. Anyway, come find me at the bar and tell me I'm dumb.